This is Linux Unplugged, episode 191, on April 4th, 2017. My name is Wes, and welcome to this week's episode of Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that's throwing a party while the boss is away. We've got an awesome show for you this week, but we're mixing things up. Chris, oh Chris, he is traveling the country, headed to Texas, as I'm sure you all know. We don't need him though. That's right. No, we don't need him. We've got a huge show. We're going to talk a lot of stuff. We've got the latest from all your favorite open source projects, plus uh, something from, from Telegram. Some cool pictures that can finally explain containers and Docker. And an elegant Vim distribution that will make you say, is this Emacs? Plus the latest from LibreBoot and their relationship with the Free Software Foundation. Some stuff, interesting stuff from Fedora. They claim, hey, Hacker News, you're picky about desktops. Wait, wait, Fedora and GNOME, we've got what you need. Then, did you know Android? Yeah, that's right. Android has overtaken Windows as the internet's most used operating system. We discuss what does that what does that mean for Linux, for Windows, for the world at large. And then and then we get into I'm sure what will be a heated discussion. What does it mean to be a proper distro? So, how are we going to do all this? Can't be with just me. No. We have a special guest this week. That's right. It's a little bit interesting this week. We are joined by our friend, new to the network. You heard him here last week, Joe Ressington. Welcome to the show, Joe. Hey, thanks, man. Uh, Uh, Wonderful to have you. Sounding a bit better this time. Absolutely, sound great. I think we're in for an excellent show today. Yeah. Uh, Let's see. We're going to cover some. Got some just interesting news updates. Some follow-ups to projects that we've been following along in past episodes. Before we get to all of that, though. Let me introduce the thing that makes this show what it is, our wonderful mumble room. Time appropriate greetings, mumble room. Greetings, greetings. Hello, Hello, Wes. Ah, welcome, everybody. Everybody, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you for joining me. Chris is away. He's venturing across the country down to Texas. I'm sure you've all been following along. Go check out his vlog. If not, it's a lot of fun. Uh, so Joe and I are running the show today with your gracious help. So let's see. First up. You you may have heard this. A lot of people on the network are using it. Our friends over at Telegram, why they've introduced voice calling, and I believe it's coming to Linux as well. This is just a little bit of an update, but it really highlighted for me some of the things like why I have mixed feelings about Telegram. Uh, So over the past few months, we've worked hard to make sure Telegram calls are the best in terms of quality, speed, and security. The wait is over. Today, we're rolling out voice calls in Western Europe. The rest of the world will get them very soon as well. So that seems does that pretty mean I exciting. I get it before you, Wes. Yes, I think it does. Ah, I'm jealous. I mean, I don't know. I don't. I don't know about you, Joe. I don't use video calls all that often. I mean, I have occasionally, maybe like a more for like a work conference, really, than you know, casual acquaintances or spouses or anything like that. Yeah, and the thing is, it's not like there aren't enough options already. It, this is just right. yet another one, which I suppose is good in a way, but it just I, it feels a bit redundant to me. I can't see myself really using it. Yeah. So some of the things that that stood out to me, like they they have a a quote here from the article. That's why we've improved the key exchange mechanism to make sure your call is 100 percent secure. You and your recipient just need to compare four emoji over the phone. No lengthy codes or complicated pictures. Now, the emoji idea is kind of interesting, but it really brings back to like kind of the questionable security telegram rolling their own security and like I understand the marketing you want, you know, especially today, especially after all the news with FTC, et cetera. Privacy is important. It's nice to see that they think that their base likes privacy. But just saying things like 100 percent secure, uh, I'm not sure. They also talk a lot about how each time you make a voice call on Telegram, a neural network learns from you and your device's feedback. I don't have a I don't have a problem with that. They highlight that, you know, they're not listening to your calls necessarily. It's more just metadata about it. Just the hype. Like, I was excited to see the feature. I won't use it, but the hype around the article kind of rubbed me the wrong way. What do you guys think? Well, I mean, I'm looking at this emoji thing, and why can't they just use four numbers or four characters? Surely it's easier to just say B A U O or something rather than uh, kind of a sun smiley face thing and kind of two. Fingers. What if they were saying P E B C D? And it's well, basically the same sound, whereas you say goat, broccoli, 
Something like that. It's because there are lots and lots of emoji and there are only 10 numbers and there are only 26 alphabetic characters in the Latin alphabet. It's way easier to generate very long keys and then turn those into uh, one of a number of, like a small number of uh, emojis than it would be to generate a long key and then get you to read that long key out. That's a better point. I still think it's easier to just say it as well. So there's like multi-factor. <laughs> yeah, that uh, that may be true. Um, anyway, I'm still using Telegram. I've been playing with Wire a little bit. Um, there are, you know, there's also Signal. Uh, I saw some progress on Signal no longer needing or acquiring the, the Google Play libraries. I'm not sure what the status of that is. Um, Telegram yeah, really just has say? kind of the people that are using it in my life, but I really would... I would like to not be as hooked to the platform. Well, the thing is, you're going to end up hooked to yet another platform, aren't you? Because even if you get a few friends on that, right? That's the danger of even trying it out. Yeah, and you've well, still, the, I'm the, still the, using WhatsApp. I'm using Telegram. Do I really need another one? Yeah, exactly. The Wire one is interesting because it has the uh, open sourcing of the server. So that one is the most interesting because you can do like a, a private wire, oh, and that's what yeah, that's okay. what I'm most. Um, I'm curious about when, because they say the end of quarter one, which is basically over now, but it's, they could still say, you know, somewhere in April, they could release it and still be technically around quarter one. Right. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Well, we'll have to, we'll have to stay tuned for that then. Yeah. The Telegram phone calls, I've, I've played with it and it's, it is interesting. Um, there are bugs where if you don't have your phone on, it doesn't ring. Uh. But if you are on your phone it rings like a regular phone call and you just answer it from the notifications or whatever, however you want. Okay. And it is pretty cool. It, it does work pretty well. And, and the, uh, the quality of the, the, the sound is, is a lot higher than I would have expected. And, uh, the, uh, the second, the uh, last thing that's important is, um, I don't think there's any video. I think it's just audio. Ah, okay. I see. I think, I think the video part is new that it's just coming. I, I don't think it's hit the States yet. Oh yeah, they they said that the uh, the uh, the phone call was going to go to the was Europe, then the uh, states, and then I guess they're going to do the video roll out the same way. Okay, that makes sense. Excellent. Well, yes, I will say the one thing about it that that has always in the past it has just I mean it's snappy, it works. I don't have a lot of problems with it generally. Uh, so in, so in that case, I look forward to seeing what they continue to do. Okay, so on to our next story this week. Uh, this one also just like a quick little update. Um, I really like seeing things explained with pictures. It's not always easy to do, but in a world filled with man pages, which don't get me wrong, man pages are great. I love them. I use them all the time. And personally, I prefer kind of longer form articles over necessarily like a video. Videos have their place, but for me, I, I generally will read like a longer tutorial. But especially for communicating something in a presentation or a talk or to people who perhaps don't have an hour to read an article, I think explaining complex ideas in pictures really can be a big win. So I just want to talk. There's a uh, consoliacomic.com. I had not seen it before. Uh, it's uh, mostly about programming and nerd stuff drawn by a back-end developer, which explains why it looks so bad. But really, I think it looks pretty good. Uh, not, It's not amazing. It's not you know beautiful design work or anything like that. But I like the concept. So uh, just looking at their most recent issue, containers and Docker. And so especially uh, on Linux, where containers aren't necessarily... You know, a first-class concept. You've got C groups and namespaces and other things. I thought this was a nice little, uh, just a nice little drawing to come check out. Explain to people who maybe you know they come from somewhere else. They haven't used this concept. They're migrating from Windows. Uh, I thought it was a useful diagram, so maybe you guys will too. Yeah, it breaks it down nicely and uh, just makes it kind of visual, which is, as you said, rather than trying to read through loads of stuff, there's quite a lot of writing with it as well. But even if you just scroll down and just catch the pictures, you can get an idea of how containers and Docker and all that kind of stuff works. So, yes, yeah, worth checking out. Do you use uh, containers, Docker, that sort of technology very much on your end, Joe? Not really. Um, I tend to be more old school, really. I don't have the, the requirement for it, really. Yeah. Um, Experimenting with snaps and stuff like that, and um, and and Mara uses containers, but, but no, I mean I, I don't get in depth enough with the kind of servers I have to run. Right, the, it's all very straightforward stuff. So not yet. Maybe this is a good opportunity. Um, you know, we I got to talk to you last week, but other than that, we haven't done a show before. Um, so I don't really know that much about your uh, your background. I mean, I've listened to some of your podcasts, of course, uh, which I enjoy very much. But uh, what do you what do you do as your day job or other things? Oh, that's a mystery. Oh, excellent. That's even that. better. <laughs> but no, you do I, I solve problems basically. Okay, there we go. Day job. Perfect. Columbo. 
<laughs> <laughs> no, I don't solve cases. I solve problems for people. All sorts of problems for people is what I do. Oh, excellent. Hey, jack of all trades or uh, yep, Joe exactly. of all trades, fixer. whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, all right. So on to our next story. Uh, recently, I've been doing some development work in a language called Clojure, which is a Lisp for the JVM. Uh, in search of a very good development environment for that, I ended up using Emacs, but I have not, never been an Emacs user. I've always kind of used Vim very minimally, um, especially you know if I'm just writing Python or for other dynamic languages where I don't need a heavy IDE, really. Um, and I found SpaceMax, uh, and SpaceMax is an Emacs distribution that's kind of tar- targeted towards... Vim users and people who want uh, easier setup or kind of a pre-built thing that has a lot of pluggable options. And then I saw Space Vim, an elegant Vim distribution inspired by Space Max. What is Space Vim? Space Vim is a Vim distribution for Vim plugins, resources, and is compatible with both Vim and NeoVim. It is inspired by Space Max and mimics Space Max in a high level, especially in the whole architecture, key bindings, and GUI. Um, so I don't know if this will be interesting or anything, but I've had some very positive experiments, experiences with SpaceMax as a newcomer to the Emacs realm where I really, you know, maybe if I if I like it, I'm going to keep using it over the next years, then sure, I can, you know, dive in, learn Emacs Lisp, figure out how to actually configure it, those kinds of things. But SpaceMax made it really easy for me to kind of pick up and go and just focus on doing the development work that I was trying to do. Um, Joe, Mumble Room, do you guys have any strong preferences? I don't want to get into an editor war here, um, but <laughs> yeah. do you see value in maybe an extra configuration layer, especially for things where, you know, there's different plugin systems? This can kind of provide a way to have one, one might argue, an additional way to do it, uh, but one kind of higher level way to get started with configuration. Uh, any way to, to an make... nano user. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I'm not much, much use on this, but I can see if you're... Um, you know, if if you're a dev and you you're using it every day, um, then this could be a useful way to, uh, as you say, at like a higher level um, config. Certainly, getting into it if you're making the transition from Nano to a, a proper text editor. I've really started a war there. Over <laughs> yeah, proper, yes. <laughs> no, I know. Uh, I know many Nano users, uh, Chris included, of this program. Um, it's a fine, it's a fine editor, and uh, you know one thing you can say about it is it lets you focus on the text that you're editing and nothing else. So that's nice too. Yeah, the Unix philosophy: do one thing and do it well. Yeah, right. Yes, exactly that. There is there is no space nano, so it's dead to me. This this whole initiative. <laughs> yeah, no, that's yeah, fair. That's fair. Uh, uh, space uh, nano. Maybe we'll have to do that. So, listeners, if you you like the space theme. Maybe you like these editors. I do think you should give them a shot if you're uh, new to Vim or Emacs, uh, though I've not tried Space Vim yet. Uh, maybe someone will make a Space Nano. Well, if you want to, uh, you know, high, better configure a Nano to be better, uh, you can use Emacs or Vim. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, good one. Uh, good or one Sublime Text. Time. Yes, that's true. Sublime Text, Atom, VS Code. There's uh, kind of a plethora of options, even if you don't go into the full IDE space. Or just use Pluma. <laughs> yeah. Or G edit. It's good choice. It's a fine, fine editor. I know I've seen a couple like more minimal ones. I think I think one's actually called Joe uh, that are <laughs> that are kind of uh, trying to fill yeah, that same. Yeah, Joe, Joe and Jed. Yeah, Jed, right? Okay. Micro now as well, which is very good. Yeah, yeah it's a good. Uh, I think it's a good problem to have here. Okay, so moving on. That was just some updates. We've got another update. Uh, we talked about this recently uh, about LibreBoot in general, kind of what their what their mission is, how, some of their interactions with other projects. You guys may remember that LibreBoot and the Free Software Foundation have been kind of in a state of discord. So now there's an update from the LibreBoot project. You can argue about the interpretation, but one way that it's been been stated is LibreBoot no longer opposes the GNU project or the Free Software Foundation. We have made peace. So they write, over the past six months, the LibreBoot project has been in a state of discord. After an issue with a transgender employee at the FSF escalated, LibreBoot publicly left GNU with little consultation from the community. Relations with so many people were strained. Friendships broken. Lines of code never written. The chaos needs to come to an end. With all this in mind, were the allegations against the Free Software Foundation true? Perhaps, perhaps not. At this point, it doesn't matter. Indeed, it is unlikely that LibreBoot will ever rejoin the GNU, but feuding in an already fragmented community helps nobody. The world of free software is shrinking and under attack. 
know, the FSS may make mistakes from time to time, so do we. We do not need another divide. So no more royal we, no more notorious surprises, no more late night typo fixes. Transparency and collaboration are the way forward. So that's what we get. That's what we get from uh, from the latest from the Libre Root project. Joe, what did you think about this? Had you followed? Um, you know, they only joined the FSF. It looks like um, I was reading some old Veronix articles in May of 2016. So really, not that much. It's barely been a year. Not even. Uh, there's been a lot of drama in that short time. Yeah, I mean, I've been following this story for what feels like a year or more now. Well, well actually, probably less than that, about six months maybe. And yeah, the the head dev of Libre Boot um, just fell out with the Free Software Foundation and uh, decided to divorce from GNU. And then it it sort of went quiet for a while. And then we heard from Stallman, I think, he piped up and said that, um, well, it's not your decision to make, but um, we'll let you do it anyway. We'll let you go. Um, whereas now it turns out that um, I think it's uh, Leah Rowe was, um, is right. in charge or was in charge, but now it's looking like she has admitted that it wasn't a great way to kind of go on and she wasn't uh, in the right kind of um, mental place, I suppose, to, to make those decisions. And I suppose it highlights that um, if you've got one person in charge of a project, how that can cause problems if you don't have a kind of democracy or at least you know a team of people there if it's one person calling all the shots for it then that's when these things can happen and at the end of the day drama and politics you know it's great for shows like this for us to talk about something but really we want harmony don't we we want people getting on with porting libra boot to as many different um chipsets as possible trying Precisely. to get you know, some some properly free software running machines top to bottom. And, and you know, drama like this is not going to help that. Yeah. Well, also, let's point out that the reason the person was, uh, the, Le- the Libre Brute was decided to leave was because the person who was fired from GNU or the FSF was a completely different person from the, from the fallout of what happened. And the person who's, who's fired was claimed by this by the by the leader of Libre Boot that that the person was fired because of being a transgender, which was not true. And the person who was actually fired has never made a statement on it. So it's really an overreaction situation, but it's nice to know that they calmed down and started reacting to a normal state of we should be working on getting things done rather than freaking out over the employment of other people. Yeah, I mean, we don't really know exactly what went on is the, the main right. problem there. You know, we, we, we only got kind of, you know, a hearsay basically. So it's, it's pointless to really speculate on the politics of it. And, and I think that that's why really the best thing to do is concentrate on, look, this seems to have been resolved now. And, you know, hopefully we can get some code written and some machines running totally free software. Uh, yeah, that sounds that sounds awesome. Yeah, we can get back to. So, I mean, I was hopeful about the tone. Uh, hopefully, people can can really have some peace and feel better about things and just yeah, get to get to work, get some awesome things deblobbed, continue the march to freedom. Anyone else yeah. have anything they'd like to add on that story? I feel like it's a non-statement and it's like, oh, we've settled things, but we're not going to tell you what actually happened or be transparent about you. We just started drama for some reason. We're not going to state that reason. And I understand that there may be privacy. Maybe the persons involved don't want to state that. I feel like it's just causing, it could just be causing drama for drama's sake and it's really not helpful so ww you, would you describe that as and the value of this is negative yes i, I would just say it, if it's personal take it up with them solve it don't make it public there was a recent problem with the drupal project that was personal about someone's uh personal life and did not need to be brought up at all you, you don't really need this you know so it really is a double negative for me. It's like, okay, why would I use Libra Root then if this is how, how you react? So I don't know. I, I haven't really kept up to it as much as other people, but it just seems like a not newsworthy item to me when they're just 
creating drama. Um, the other piece that's important, uh, and while I agree with actually everything you guys have brought up, um, is that the what ended up happening now is that Libra Boot has sort of spun off, and now you, we have Libra Core, which is sort of a broken up piece from Libra Boot, right? So this is the actual community members from Libra Boot. So Leah Rowe, who you know was really the only person behind uh, Libra Boot, uh, which of course just takes Core Boot and you know doesn't ship with the blobs that come with Core Boot, uh, and so uh, now there's actually an effort to have a completely freed stack that's called Libra Core, which is outside of Leah Rowe's um, uh, you know, domain. And that's starting to gain traction within the Core Boot community. Uh, and the reason happens to be because of the you know, kind of, I'll say, ridiculous nature of, uh, of bringing in personal preference uh, to something that uh, shouldn't have ever been brought in to begin with. Right? It was a project, uh, a community-based project with a lot of people involved. Uh, with one person that controlled the wiki and the uh, GitHub account and could kind of go rogue. So that's one of the reasons that Libra Core is now uh, gaining traction, just, just so you guys know. No, thank Does you. this that's speak helpful. to a larger problem? Does this speak to a larger problem in the kind of community-driven software? Whereas, you know, with more with commercial software and a lot of proprietary software that is commercial, you've got a human resources department that is probably going to stop this stuff going public, you know, it will be dealt with internally. Whereas with community projects, you don't have that management structure there and things just end up leaking out onto the internet and drama happens as a result. Uh, you know, that's, I think that's a great um, point to, to raise. I think that uh, a Libra boot sort of is the, uh, you know, quintessential example of, of what not to do uh, in the case of a community driven project. And, uh, and we, I don't really know of many others that we can point to that sort of have that, that issue. Uh, so in most cases, I'd say people would be sane about, uh, you know, uh, something that they is, you know, hearsay from a friend of theirs. And they might, they would actually take that up through the proper channels uh, rather than turning it into a, you know, a very uh, public flame war. So um, if there were a bunch of examples, then I think that it could be start to become a concern. But as it is right now, I can I can literally only think of that one as the example. It reminds me of all the times that Linus gets called out in press because he said something harsh about someone's code, and they end up taking it personally because that's how they take it. That's what this kind of reminds me about in the reporting of upon it by whoever because they're focusing on the personal aspect and not the technological aspect so right i actually think that because a valid point uh that my only counter to that is um that uh linus you know is speaking about something that is taken out of context in this case uh, you know libra boot or specifically leah row uh is, is the one who Took it all out of context on her own, and then you know announced everything, and basically you know making a making a big deal of it. So that would be isn't to take the same analogy, anyway. right? The same analogy would be that Linus basically starting to you know have a blow up fit and trying to take it to the press and make sure that everybody's aware of things. Um, and so it, it, but your your point's not lost in that it, a lot of times these you know personal attacks or even a you know non intentional personal attack can sort of, uh, uh, you know, explode. I, I think that uh, I think that's a very good summary of, of this whole incident, and we'll just kind of have to wait and see uh, see what happens next. I think now, that brings us to some happier news. It's time to talk about our first sponsor of this fine Linux Unplugged program, and that is our friends over at Linux Academy. What is Linux Academy? Linux Academy is the best place to go learn all the latest Linux, DevOps, system administration skills that the market is craving for. Go check out them. Go to linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. That's our little promo code. That gets you a seven week or seven day, excuse me, seven day. We don't want to be unreasonable here. Seven day free trial where you can get started learning Ruby, Python, Chef, basic Linux server administration. You can study for Red Hat certificates. They've got so much great stuff at Linux Academy. And one thing I've always really liked about them, I mean, I've kind of been following them since they got started, since they, even before they became a sponsor on this show, and they really are Linux advocates. They're people who use Linux 
you know, they eat their own dog food. They use Linux to run their company. They've used Linux in their personal lives and they understand how Linux gets used. I've also been very impressed at that even among kind of, you know, older crufty sysadmins who don't need, you know, would say they don't need the site or, uh, you know, ah, uh, what, what is this newfangled thing? No, Linux Academy has seen massive adoption across the industry. It's quickly becoming something that you can point to and say, look, I've done these courses. Yeah, it doesn't mean that I'm, you know, a uh, senior level principal expert, but it does show that you've got real hands-on experience. It gives employers a way to kind of assess, well, if they've passed these courses, if they've had these, you know, real instructor, instructors there to teach them these things, they know it's a good environment to learn. Plus, they've really got a lot of good stuff for DevOps stuff. So even if you've been doing Linux for years, but maybe now, you know, your company's moving to the cloud, you have to embrace AWS, you're suddenly using a new configuration management system, Linux Academy is a great place to turn to, to figure all that out in a structured way. I know when I'm learning something, a lot of times it's fun, right? We, we especially here in this community, we like these kinds of technologies, we like playing with them. I can find it can get pretty easy to get distracted and, you know, oh, I'm learning this new language and suddenly I got engrossed in this feature, but really that's not what I need to be doing. What I need to be doing is learning the high level fundamentals. The rest, you know, you learn as, as you do on the job when you're working on a project and Linux Academy has distilled these things down to step-by-step -step video courses. They've got downloadable comprehensive study guides. Plus, you know, you want to learn AWS, don't worry about their weird free tier. Don't worry about putting your credit card on the line and then leaving the server running and getting a big bill in the mail. I think that's happened to just about everyone who has done that. Now, Linux Academy, they take care of that for you. They spin up the servers. They make sure that the distribution you're studying, that's the distribution you get. If you want to study a different distribution, they remap all the commands for you. They've got their guides for those different distributions. They've customized it for you. It's just always getting better. So don't waste any more time. Go learn in a structured way. Give it a try. Head on over to linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. Start your seven-day free trial today. And uh, if you have a good time, let them know that the Linux Unplugged program sent you over. Ah, oh, good old Linux Academy. So if that's gotten you excited for Linux, and, and it should if you're here for the Linux Unplugged program, I think our next little bit of new to ISM, it struck me, it's interesting. So there... This is an article over on blogs.gnome.org talking about Hacker News feedback on what they want from their desktop. Fedora and Gnome say, hey, we've got it. So it starts out, there's a, there was a thread on Hacker News based on a question from a canonical employee asking for feedback on what people want from the next version of Ubuntu. I always try to read such threads, even when they are not about Fedora or Red Hat. In fact, I often read such articles and threads about non-Linux systems, too, to help understand what people are looking for and thus enable us to prioritize what we do with Fedora Workstation even better. Over the last few years, I do feel we've managed to nail down what the major pain points are and cross them out one by one or gotten people assigned to work on them. So a lot of the items people ask for in that thread, we already have in the Fedora Workstation or have already on our roadmap. I mean, those two things are different, but whatever. Uh, so I thought it would be nice to write them up and maybe encourage people to take a look at Fedora Workstation if you haven't done so already. So just some things they, they highlight here on this list. They've got handling of DPI scaling and H, uh, high DPI, what am I saying? Uh, he does admit that things are not perfect yet, um, but there's active work ongoing. I've had some pretty good experiences with GNOME on Wayland and high DPI screens, but I... I only have a couple. I don't have one at home. I have some at work, so I, I, I don't have the most experience. Uh, it's nice to see that they take it seriously, though. Another one here, which I think a lot of people we may talk about later in the show struggle with, is multi-touch gestures. And, you know, they really come from, like, a OSX world. They're really used to those very nice touchpads. You know, lots of, lots of algorithms go in to determine just what you want. Very nice gestures that have been de developed over the years. Um, so they say this is another item that we've put significant effort into. Over the last few years, we've made sure we went from almost no touch support in the desktop to now supporting touch throughout the stack. The one big remaining item that was holding items like proper gestures back is that until kernel 4.12 is out, the Synaptics touchpad are using PS slash 2. This causes only two gestures to be reported, which is not great when you want three-fingered gestures. Yeah, uh, I think that's true. Uh, so just to quickly summarize kind of the rest of the things, battery life is an item here on their list. Um, I think that that's definitely an important one if you're using a laptop. Uh, to kind of show some of the nice, the GNOME battery bench here, which is kind of an interesting tool. Uh, next up is UEFI issues. Uh, there are people on the Hacker News thread talking about issues with UEFI. Once again, this is an era we have a dedicated engineer assigned to UEFI and making sure it works great. In fact, Peter Jones, who is our UEFI point man, is on the UEFI standards committee 
doing ongoing work to ensure the standard is open source friendly and well supported by Linux. I will also add that you know Fedora did do a lot. Um, Matthew Garrett helped there as well back in the day, getting UFI support. They you know built that shim bootloader. Some of the things that we rely on today, if you are in a required secure boot kind of environment, or if you just want to take advantage of you know the UFI that comes standard on so many laptops now. Uh, just to round out the list, they've also got you know hey we've got Wayland support. Uh, that's true. I mean, if you install it, install the latest Fedora release, you'll get GNOME on Wayland. I think that's, that is pretty neat. It's nice to see them pushing things forward. <laughs> They've also got something like Redshift. I know when I saw the news of, you know, Apple releasing the, the Redshift in their new OS X, I was like, hey, are they, uh, are they, are they copying GNOME there? But you know what's missing from this list, Wes? Yes, what? Con configurability. Yeah. Now, is it just me? Is it just that I want to be able to configure my desktop or... You know, or did, is it just missing? Because could it be that people want a desktop like GNOME or Unity, which is pretty much this is how it is. You can configure it a tiny bit, but take it or leave it. Uh, do people just want to fire up a desktop and just get on with it and not spend hours and hours configuring it? I do. I do think. I mean, I think a lot of times I may fall into that location. I certainly have enjoyed configuration in the past. Don't get me wrong. Um, but what, for whatever reason, lately, like I really haven't had like a main desktop, a main computer that I'm always at, or one that doesn't kind of float between distributions or get re-imaged. Uh, and so I've kind of found a lot of value in in GNOME for that. I mean, I do install a couple of plugins, maybe add a theme, but it's pretty minimal and it gets me to a consistent environment that I can kind of just drop into, get some work done, pull up a terminal, pull up Slack, pull up Chrome, and uh, get to work. When I read through Dustin's post on Hacker News, the the whole idea of configuration and exposing more options to the the you know to rearrange the desktop didn't didn't feature it was really about um, refining things to a level that meet the expectations that people people have come to expect from for example Mac OS 10 so it was really about improving and making bluetooth support bulletproof uh, improving high DPI support, although that one's interesting because the Unity 7 high DPI support is quite decent because you've got um, um, fractional scaling, whereas in GNOME it's integer only, so you can right. scale 1, 2, 3, not 1.25, for example. Which, and that one, you know, the, the fractional scaling is quite handy because on like a 13 inch uh, laptop with a 1080p screen on Unity, you can scale that to 1.25 and just make everything that little bit bigger. And it's quite, it's quite a, a useful feature. And likewise, on laptops with, you know, the old 1280 by um, 800 resolution screens, the way you can zoom out and artificially create, you know, additional uh, desktop real estate. Um, but it was, yeah, the, the things that I got out of that was it was about improving the essential stuff, everything to do with input and output, basically human, human interaction. So trackpad support needed to be, um, multi-touch and gesture, Bluetooth needed to be better. Wi-Fi needed to be more reliable. And that wasn't just, um, uh, in the wake of the recent issues, it was, um, being competitive and, um, power competitive with, uh, power usage, power consumption competitive with um, Windows and um, battery endurance needed to be improved on, on you know, Linux in general. So that, they, that it was all about refinement rather than wholesale changes. Yeah, it does seem like something that people people are kind of want to expect these days. I mean, new things are exciting, but you really you want you want to see those kinds of refinement that you can really get. I know. Um, the last really positive um, review of Mint on this on this network was that was exactly what they had, they had felt right it was like yeah you've hit it here you've really dialed it in what you were doing you've you've taken the time you didn't make crazy improvements but you've all those little details have been ironed out and that's a that's a hard place to get to. May I jump in here? Please do. My wish for mainstream desktops would be the independent treatment of monitors and virtual desktops on dual or multi-screen setups. Because I have that in Enlightenment, but I haven't seen another window manager of Windows in my environment that can do that. Maybe it's possible on tiling managers too? So do you mean um, like a separate virtual desktop for each monitor? 
it's like imagine you have a dual screen setup and you have four virtual desktop on each monitor. So on Unity, for example, if you switch the virtual desktop from one to two, you switch to two monitors. So imagine you only switch the left one and the right one stays the same. So in GNOME 3, you have the on dual screen setups, you have one monitor that only stays on one virtual desktop and the other one has multiple virtual desktops. So in Enlightenment, the two monitors are completely treated independent. So I can have five virtual desktops on the left screen and four virtual desktops on the right screen, and I can switch them independently. That's really cool. Yeah, that's a, a toolkit feature, which some of the toolkits lack, unfortunately. Yeah, it's it's something you can do a somewhat work around with Plasma, but um, I've, I've tested it. Uh, most tiling window managers have the ability to do that. Yeah, I guess so. Tiling managers are easier to do uh, to to handle that. I guess. Yeah, I three so, for sure. Xmonad for sure. Uh, I think Awesome does too. Enlightenment can do that too. So I run Enlightenment twenty one now, but it was possible with Enlightenment seventeen too. Nice. Well, I think that uh, that's a natural segue to our next article today. Report. Android overtakes Windows as the Internet's most used operating system. So kind of in the opposite vein of a tiling window manager, we have Android, which only recently got even multi-window support. Joe, are you an Android person? Do you have much Android in your life? What do you what is what do you think this means for Linux users, mobile users and everyone else? If is this uh, is this the trend that we should expect to continue to see? Definitely. You, you say to me, do I have a lot of Android in my life? Well, Often people will ask me, what is the, the, the primary operating system or, or desktop or whatever that I use on my main machine? And I say to them, Lineage OS. I used to say CyanogenMod because my phone, I've got a OnePlus One that's still trucking away. Nice. And, uh, and the, the fact is that with a 5.5-inch screen, and I I'm, I'm travel around quite a lot, I mean, yes, I have my laptops, I have a desktop as well, I have tablets, but I generally find myself using the phone. And everyone I know and everyone I meet, it seems to me that they are um, using phones and tablets these days. That everyone has gone mobile. And, you know, it used to be I'm the, the techie person that friends know and friends of friends know, and I would always have to reinstall Windows for people, try right. and convince them to, uh, you know, go to Linux, but I'm not quite as good as Noah, it seems, when it comes to that. He has an so uncanny up- ability, that's for sure. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but these days, I don't know, over the last few years, I've just had less and less of that to the point where I can't even remember the last time I dealt with that. Now it's, can you deal with this phone? Can you change my cracked screen? And I say, no, no, I can't do that kind of stuff. Well, I can, but I don't want to do it for them. So, you know, I, the, the reality of the situation is that in our little Linux bubble where there's a lot of devs and, you know, hardcore gamers and stuff like that, the, the Linux on the desktop and the desktop computing generally and laptops are still very prevalent. But the reality is out there in the, the big bad world, unless you are at work, most people are not using laptops anymore. And so that's why it's not a surprise to me at all to hear that Windows has now shrunk below Android in terms of um, web users. I mean, it's it's you can never be truly sure whether these stats are, you know, accurate. Right. But yes. I think it's... It's, it seems to reflect what anecdotally I have seen out there in the real world and what I keep hearing. Yeah, no, I, w- I would say the same thing. So having expressed like uh, the sentiment for configurability and maybe even control, that sort of thing, how do you feel about Android as a platform? Does, I mean, clearly you've, you have gone a little bit less than mainstream exploring other operating systems. Does Android or some of the, you know, the forks or open source versions or, or ROMs, do they meet your need for you know what you like about a Linux desktop on your phone? Or are your needs sufficiently different that it doesn't really make sense? Well, my needs are definitely different, but I would, uh, for me, it's it's more about the freedom, the, you know, the free software open source aspect of it and how realistically, I, well, I can't use uh, a, a Google free Android phone. Right. You know, they, that's just as simple as that. I think that's, I have yeah, there's flash. a lot of people in that boat, unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever you may feel. Yeah, I mean, thanks to OpenGApp's Pico, I flash the Play Store, and that's it. And then, you know, I don't have any of the the craft. If you, even a Nexus phone has a lot of bloatware, as far as I'm concerned. That might sound controversial, but all of the, you know, Google Play magazines and all that kind of stuff, I'm not, not interested in it. So, I mean, in terms of configurability, 
yes, it is suiting my needs. And I can install my custom launcher. I use ADW1 launcher, and I have a very minimal desktop, well, yeah, I suppose you'd call it a desktop experience on it. Um, but in terms of the freedom, more and more of Android is creeping to being proprietary. Google are replacing more and more of it with proprietary blobs, and meaning that even if you run just F-Droid and, and Lineage with no Google apps, you're going to struggle with some of the apps because they, you know, they, they, they require the Google Play services. Um, I mean, I suppose not as much with F-Droid applications, but it, it's not as useful to to me anyway. It's it's nowhere near as useful. I need certain proprietary applications is the, the bottom line, a lot of the Google stuff, and, um, and certainly WhatsApp. I need that for work all the time. So, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of functionality, it's there, but in terms of freedom, it's not. And that's why I... I stick to the Linux desktop and, and why if we could get something like Ubuntu phone to the standard of Android, which, you know, there's, it's a long way off. And especially now that uh, Ubuntu phone is somewhat on hiatus. Um, I don't know if Popey will correct me on that, but um, you know, it, it feels a long way off, but if we could get it to the point where it was as good and as usable, then I'd be much happier about it. Having a, a truly free software operating system running on my phone. Uh, do you mind if I chime in? Please uh, do. Talk? Please do, Todd. Uh, uh, because we're actually at, this is purism, and, and we're um, we're actually going to be coming out with a phone campaign in September. We've been working with a bunch of the Open Moco developers, um, and we've uh, pinned our hardware on Intel Z CPU that we can actually separate the baseband, and so we'll be able to run Pure OS, which of course is a Debian fork, uh, on the phone. The development cycle is probably going to be Q2 of next year, 2018, by the time our hardware will be shipping to, to users. But uh, and the reason, of course, is because so many people are wanting to have an actual you know, Linux kernel on a phone that they can control. So uh, we've actually tested GNOME 3. We're, we're uh, working with the GNOME Foundation to develop the couple of remaining applications that are needed, uh, primarily uh, actually, if you can believe it, a simple phone dialer, <laughs> phone dialer app uh, that's missing. So uh, that is something that you'll see from us coming out in, uh, you know, in the next handful of months. Interesting. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. But the, the big question I would have is how much of that hardware is going to work with truly free software? I mean, are you going to get to a situation where the Wi-Fi isn't working properly and, uh, you know, how, how, how well is it actually going to work with completely free software is the, the question. Okay. Uh, it's going to be 100 percent wow that's uh well, presumably the, the cellular modem is not going to work because you that just you can't do that right so you can um what it's going to be is it's going to be a separate usb device that will allow us to have a uh, baseband uh, via usb so it will have its own of course firmware within the baseband uh, but it's going to be a separate isolated baseband which is not an issue the main issue from a baseband standpoint is by using qualcomm that the baseband is connected to the CPU. So uh, what we're looking at then is, is having a separate uh, baseband option. But uh, the wireless, of course, will be free. Uh, and you can actually also have it be a, a hardware kill switch for the baseband to be able to then use it via wireless-only device. Interesting. So the separation of the baseband from the CPU is the biggest um, hardware hurdle to accomplish. And that's where, you know, again, we spent an awful lot of time doing the research to figure out how we can separate that baseband so we can actually isolate it uh, as, as a simple chip that uh, communicates to the baseband provider. So the goal for us is to have it be a, a completely unlocked phone that you can walk into any carrier, get a SIM card, slide it in the baseband slot, and then have, car have carriage if you want, uh, or have it be a Wi-Fi only device where um, all of the services would be VoIP uh, services. Do you think now, do you this expect sounds any... expensive to me? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, so you know, it, they're they're not going to be cheap, uh, but they will be within the range of buying a, a phone off the shelf. So we're looking at somewhere in the ballpark of five ninety nine or six ninety nine type of uh, 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 end uh, customer price. So at that price, what kind of um, what kind of hardware fit and finish should people expect to see? It's going to be a, a metal case around the five inch size and uh, you're running an Intel uh, Z uh, CPU. 
and of course, Intel GPU. Right. Okay. Uh, so where can people go if they're curious about this, Todd, to find out more about this new project? Well, it's uh, right now, it's a lot of it. We ran a survey on our website. So that's, of course, Purism, P-R-I.S-M. Uh, and people can follow along there. Okay. We're, we're sort of doing a lot of the, the research um, uh, behind the scenes at the moment until we can pin down the hardware. The process overall is uh, now that we have our, we'll call it the shopping list, as we've narrowed down all the hardware through, you know, uh, past projects like OpenMoco, and uh, we, we've narrowed down the shopping list. So the next step for us is to take that to a number of fabrication houses who already have fabricated five inch uh, screens and five inch uh, phones. And there's actually a fair number of them. Then we see, have you also done uh, Intel CPUs? And then we can leverage a reference design for that process. And so we're at that stage now. Once we have picked a fabricator and then we can actually know our cost. At that point, we're going to run a, a crowdfunding campaign to say, hey, how many people are interested in basically having a you know, Linux-driven phone that you can control? Uh, it will come for us. Of course, we're dovetailing that into a pure OS distribution. But since you guys are bringing up the phone and especially the Ubuntu Edge that you know had such a great run at the crowdfunding campaign, but they just you know pinned it an astronomical price uh, for us to, to fabricate. We're looking at um, uh, around maybe a million dollars, uh, which we feel as though we'd be able to easily meet, especially looking at how many people were interested in the Ubuntu at the time. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you for updating on this, letting us know. Uh, I know I certainly look forward to hearing about it more in the future and best of luck to you. As a side benefit, it sounds like uh, no maps might actually have a purpose now. Hey, there we go. <laughs> have you have you prototype running the GNOME desktop on a on a small screen like that? We've we've run it on a ten inch screen so far, um, but uh, um, for the five inch screen, it's it's a pretty kludged uh, you know environment. So ten inch screen works fine um, in our tests. Um, it actually works great with everything, with the except of with the exception of a dialer. But the area of software development to get to that five inch screen, uh, we know is an undertaking that we will have to invest in. And that's actually why we're looking at uh, giving such a long lead time between running the campaign in let's say September timeframe, but actually delivering product in June of 2018 because of those uh, really the software usability on a five inch screen with, uh, with GNOME is uh, we still need to uh, address the fat fingers on such a small screen. Okay. Well, if Wes gets hold of one of these, I know what SIM card he's going to put straight in it. Yes, I do. That's a perfect segue. Thank you very much, Joe. Let's take this time and hear from our next sponsor, which is our friends over at Ting. Ah, Ting. They're on a mission to make mobile make sense, and I think they're accomplishing it. So if you are going to get one of those fancy new Purism phones, or you've got a OnePlus, another niche product that you know you really love, you're really excited about, but you're like, well, what carrier am I going to do? Don't, don't go to one of those big carriers. <sighs> do something cool. Go check out Ting. Go to linux.ting.com. There you'll find pay-for-what-you-use service. It's that simple. It's so easy. It starts at $6 a month. Then you just pay for what you use, right? Minutes, megabytes, messages. Maybe you don't use any of those things. If so, then, hey, that's pretty cheap. But probably you lose, use at least one. For me, that's data. Eh, text messages, eh, maybe a phone call here or there, but ideally over Wi-Fi. Uh, and Ting makes it so easy to do that. You don't have to pay for things that you don't use and you know you won't use. And you don't have to make those, those crazy calculations where you're like, ah, uh, hmm. All right, well, I know I like to use this many things per month, but what if I need like a little bit more next month? Well, I don't want to have crazy overage charges, so I better get the next plan up and overpay the rest of the year. With Ting, if you need to use more, just use more. It's easy to find out. Their prices are just right on their rates page. Go click the rates button. You'll see a nice little table right here. You can figure out ahead of time, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over. What's the next bucket pricing? Okay, it's very clear. It's very easy to use. So if you do go check out linux.ting.com, you're gonna get a $25 service credit. Or, or if you don't already have a phone that you wanna bring, Go check out their store. They've got a lot of awesome unlocked devices, very reasonable prices, and they've got those SIM cards from $9. Yeah, that's right, $9, super reasonable. And sometimes, sometimes, check their blog. They have a lot of good stuff there. You'll see 
SIM card sales for only a dollar. Yeah, you heard it here first. That's right, one dollar. So stay tuned. They have a lot of cool stuff on their blog. They have a lot of good cord cutting things. And that's one of the other things about Ting that is so great. They're people just like us. They're nerds. They like the latest developments in Androids and open source ROMs. They like seeing what the industry is doing and how to get away from the from the regular providers. And Ting doesn't have to deal with you know putting up new polls. They get to focus on doing what they do best, which is awesome support and making it easy for you. So whether you need to use their really great app to configure your service, which works wonders, or their website, which is also amazing, or if you even need to call in, you'll talk to a real human who will help you and is very dedicated to making sure that you get the service that you need. Everyone I know that I've switched to Ting, they love it. They're having a great time and they're saving a ton of money. So don't waste time. Go over to linux.ting.com and go find yourself in a far better phone provider situation. Ah, uh, yeah, I think I definitely would use Ting with my fancy Purism phone. So we're, go- we're, running, we're running a little bit short today. Um, Mostly because we got a TechSnap program. I got here a bit late, so sorry, everyone. I know we love uh, we love Unplugged. Um, so I just want to mention something really quick. Then we're going to do the last sponsor. And then we're going to turn to some discussion as we wrap the show up. So let me just say, I saw kind of an interesting thread over on Linux dot, the, the Linux subreddit. Uh, and I just thought, after, after the ad read, maybe we can talk about it and then kind of transition. Um, I just thought it was kind of interesting as someone who does work for a company that has Linux desktops in the office. You know, we're pretty, we talk a lot about Linux desktop. We talk about the usability of it. We were just talking about how Android is supplanting Windows. One of the places that Windows still has a huge footprint, obviously, is enterprises in the office. Uh, So this was just a thread talking about how often is Linux really used in Linux-related jobs. Uh, and so Bonemaster69 here is asking, you know, he has it, he's been frustrated that his management wants him to use Windows, claiming that, you know, hey, everyone, every all these real developers, they use Windows, and you just, you know, you use a VM, or you pull up a terminal, and you go talk to your Linux machine that you do development on. And it's turned into a pretty good discussion, um, at least for Reddit. Uh, and there's also some good stats just about, like, hearing a, kind of from a diverse range of people about what do they use at work? What are they allowed to use? How many... You know, are you? Do you get to pick your own distribution? Do you have to say both on the server end or for your desktop? Do you get even get a Linux desktop? Is it all Windows and Mac? Um, so I thought that was useful. Maybe the mumbo room will have some stuff to chime in. Before we do that, let's just go here from our last sponsor, which is DigitalOcean.com. Maybe you don't get the chance to use Linux at work. You know, you're just not that lucky to use it. You know, you don't have it on your desktop, but you still need to deliver things to clients, right? You still want to use Linux. You still know that like, hey, I need a web server. What am I going to use? IIS? No, no, you're going to use Linux, right? So go on over to digitalocean.com, use our promo promo code, DO Unplugged, and get yourself a $10 credit. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And wait till you hear this. DigitalOcean prices, they start at $5 a month. And what do you get? You get an awesome virtual machine. Choose from FreeBSD, Container Linux, Ubuntu, Debian, they have, they have all the things that you want. And if not, guess what? They use KVM, so it's a real hypervisor. None of this OpenVZ stuff, none of these fake virtual things. No, you get real Linux right in the cloud, 40 gigabit E straight to that KVM hypervisor. That's what makes DigitalOcean awesome. And in less than 60 seconds, you can have one all for yourself. Uh, with that $10 promo code, it makes it really easy to get started. I know, you know, I I had found one of those. I, I was like, oh, yeah, okay, promo code. I guess I could I could start trying this service out. And I did. And since then, I've pretty much always had at least one droplet running, probably more like three or four. If you don't need something that runs all the time, but you probably do, right? Like, you know, go go put Quasal up there or, you know, another IRC bouncer if you're not cool enough to use Quasal. Um, but there's a ton of there's a ton of applications. You can run your own VPN. You can host your own email server if you really want to. There's like there's so many options that you can do. You know, run Nextcloud up there. But if if you don't need any of that, you should still consider it for their hourly pricing. That's another thing that makes DigitalOcean really nice. Is they it's just the pricing model is simple. The API is simple. They have great detailed documented documentation that really the community has embraced. You'll see sometimes on you know you go Google something. How do I do X on Linux? Usually, like the first thing you see is a DigitalOcean article. They hire real editors to help com- take community submissions, curate them, package them, and turn them into awesome documentation. Uh, 
go check them out. Look at this hourly pricing. You, you click that button, three cents an hour for two core, 40 gig of SSD disk. Yeah, that's right. It's all SSD disk. How can you resist that? Plus, they've really got a ton of nice new features. They've got monitoring in the works. They've got load balancers. They've got attachable storage, all SSD. They've got private networking if you have two droplets in the same data center. So really, if you need a Linux machine, you, you don't have it at work, just don't waste time. Go over to DigitalOcean.com, use our promo code DO Unplugged, and uh, go play with Linux today. All right. So we have, we have the topic of Linux at work. Um, Joe, we were also going to talk a little bit today about what makes a proper distribution. Um, so I'll, I'll turn that to you. You can answer either one of those questions uh, or whatever else you'd like. And uh, for the next 10, 15 minutes, let's just uh, let's discuss. Okay, well, so what makes a proper distribution? So on one end of the spectrum, if you look at DistroWatch, you see these uh, respins of Ubuntu with a new wallpaper and XFCE and they call it a, a new distribution. And everybody knows that that isn't a real distribution, right? It's not a proper distribution. Proper. But then you get things that kind of blur the lines, right? So, I mean, I'm specifically thinking about Linux Mint and Elementary OS. Okay. Now, the two of those uh, have some of their own um, code and binaries that they build, some of their own packages that they build, but at the same time, they're pointing their repos at canonical servers, right, at, at the, the Ubuntu mirrors. Now, the qu obviously, everyone use, reuses code. I mean, that's the whole point of Linux and right. distributions, it, open source and all that. You, you, reusing code is just a no-brainer. That's how these things work. But the question that I have is, if you're reusing binaries from another distribution, which uh, arguably, so well, you are basically allowed to do under the terms of most open source licenses. So there's no no problem with that. But am I going to take you less seriously as a distribution if you do that? Then yes, I am. Now let me put some caveats in here. I mean, there are, there are certain um, distros that don't sort of claim to be totally independent, like the Ubuntu flavors or the KDE, um, sorry, like the, the KDE spin of Fedora, for example, or XFCE spin. You know, they are um, using the infrastructure of a bigger project uh, that might be backed by a company. And, you know, I think that's fine because they're not pretending to be their, their own independent distribution. Whereas if you look at things like Elementary and Mint, and there are others as well, but they're just the obvious examples to me, it, I find it very difficult to take them seriously because they're not, uh, they're not properly building all of their own packages. You know, something like Solus, for example, which is a totally independent distribution built from scratch. Ike there, he takes the code and builds his own packages and uh, puts them on his own server. And, you know, it, it completely controls it. So do you worry, so, do you worry then, um, you know, that if they don't have that level of insight, right, like they may not have even needed to ever have done the build of get if they can build, get binary packages, et cetera, um, that, you know, you could potentially run into problems that they just don't have, you know, a good system to to be able to fix it, you know, without having to start building their own build infrastructure, which it doesn't seem like they really want to do. Well, I mean, they do build some of their own packages. Right, so right. I assume that they have got the infrastructure there, you know, that they could probably scale up to do that if necessary. But it's it's for me it's it's more of a um, just them having the um, the chutzpah to say we're a proper distribution. I see, right? I mean, like they, yeah, they don't. It's not like they they hide it, but obviously they have totally different marketing. They're not saying you know derivative of this or spin or anything like that. It's it's yeah, own, exactly. It's well, own I mean, they, do. So they don't do it in like the in every marketing because that would be terrible marketing but they do have it when you go to the about sections especially elementary they do explain that it is based uh, on ubuntu and they have like they have GNU slash linux in the in the the core like the information about the distro and stuff like that so it they are acknowledging but my i have a question about like where do you draw the line like if you point if you're getting your packages from a different distro is it because they're hosting the packages or because they're making the packages? Because Ubuntu kind of does that too with Debian. Well, I mean, that is a very good question. I think that for me to take you seriously, you've definitely got to host your own packages. The building of them, I mean, it depends. Sometimes it makes sense to rebuild them. Sometimes it's just a waste of electricity at the end of the day, a waste of resources. So I think that certainly hosting and building, I don't know, that that is up for debate, I think. Okay, so I'm going to throw you a curveball. What do you think of Intergos? 
Well, that and Manjaro as well to some extent. Right. Um, no, because Manjaro would technically fit your proper thing about hosting their own packages. True. Yeah, well, I, with well, Antigos is just making Arch easy, right? I mean... But they are they are technically considered its own distro, and they have their own packages and their own infrastructure for their own build servers. But all the other things, right? Like, but that's just but for their extra features. Arch right? repos and stuff, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, that's why I'm bringing this up. I'm not saying it's black and white. I'm not saying it is a definite thing. And that's why I wanted to bring it up, because it, it is an interesting question to me, because it's not... It's it's not a black and white argument here. There, there's a lot of nuance. So mm-hmm. the I'll, I'll chime in with the Free Software Foundation does have a sort of a I'll say black and white since most things from Free Software Foundation tend to be that way. Yeah. Uh, um, which is exactly as you're describing. If you if your apt get resources list uh, says um, that it's a pointing to your own for all the packages plus the source that means that you're hosting it yourself, then, um, then they consider that a distribution. If, they, if you're pointing to anybody else for any package that you're installing, then you're not a distribution. So they are aligned with what it is that you're describing. And I'll grant it, there's other, all sorts of ways around that, but that's the, that is their litmus test for determining if it's a distribution or not. Where do you so, sound on this then, Wes? I, you know... It is it is kind of a gray area, and I can see. I guess it kind of makes me think some a little bit, and I don't know where I fall on. Um, you know, it is there room enough for the value add? Um, you know, I really do respect a lot of the independent distributions. Solus is a great example. Um, they have you know, kind of whole cloth built some amazing things. Um, I wonder for some of the distributions that are maybe more, you know, resource constrained, does that open up a path where by, by piggybacking on those things, they can innovate in smaller areas or areas where other people have overlooked because they don't have to duplicate all this other effort. Um, Yeah. But if you look at something like Ubuntu Mate, I mean, Martin could have uh, Wimpy as you lot know him could have, um, taken the Ubuntu base and Mate and pointed at the repos and called it something completely different. But instead, he uh, was honest about it and, and called it um, a Ubuntu Mate remix, I think, at first, and then when right. it became an official flavor. Um, but that hasn't stopped him innovating with things like the software boutique and stuff like that. No, that's a, that's a good point. Um, I could see from the, the creator's perspective, you know, that that may... I suppose it depends on what you're, you know, what you're branching off of, what their policies may be about spins and branding and that sort of thing. And I can, I can see how people might also want, want a control issue. You know, um, we've seen some projects and distributions that have switched from, you know, hey, we were based on this before and now we're this, but hey, it's still kind of the same project. We have the same goals, but we're no longer pointing at those people's packages. We're pointing at these people's packages. And so, from that perspective, I can see why they might want to have have their own unique identity. But I do I do take your point that, you know, on some of these you might not, you know, you go to their front page and without digging, you might not even know that it that it relies on these things. Um, and you, it does make me wonder about, it, it seems like it could certainly cause problems between those distributions and make working together if, if one party doesn't feel like they're being respected or their contributions or that, you know, these people are taking their work and not appreciating all that goes into it. Um, that, that would not yeah. be good. I mean, what do you I think, think we Ubuntu? Just bypass the problem completely and just use the term distribution to describe anything that is a kind of a distribution, and then use other things like a fork or a respin or a, a derivative of, in a, or maybe create a completely different word that describes like a proper distro. But we can't. We can't something. all agree on what a proper distro is, though, can we? You could, I mean, you, could some, put an arbitrary, that... you could put an arbitrary limit and then it wouldn't matter because if you make a new word and you say this is a, to be a proper distro or be a, to be blah, you would have to be hosting your own packages and be, not be 100% reliant on anything else. Like if you are pointing to someone else's repos, you are reliant on those repos to not go down. So mm. you're not technically a proper distro or whatever we decide to be call it. So if there well, what was about a, the word... a def- what about operating system? Yeah, that's a big one. 
Well, you like, could argue that they all that kind of or... are. That's kind of a generic term. As just just true as a two. Yeah, like it's, they're both broad. They're both too broad. I was thinking that maybe we should understand re, uh, distro or distribution as I, I thought it was meant like a redistribution of the Linux kernel and then you have other things upon that that maybe there needs to be further definition of what makes a distribution a distribution and not a fork or a respin and further talking with other members of the community or well, you can also go into the, the concept like th th this is more of a nuanced argument of like you know fork is still a distribution uh, you can like ubuntu is a fork of debian and it's also kind of a derivative of debian too but it's also still its own entity thing so like it doesn't necessarily need debian but it uses it anyway as a foundation I have it's, always thought that a fork and a derivative were one and the same in the no. Linux world. And no, because you could be a derivative and not fork everything. A forking is where, like for Ubuntu's sake, they take everything that they use from Debian is taken from Debian and put into their own infrastructure. Whereas a derivative would use something that's not, like they would maybe point to other just other repos and stuff like that. Hmm. Okay. Well said, I think. Um, I think that's a natural point to uh, wrap up this episode. Uh, I think it's been a ton of fun. Let's see here. We can get some outro music. That's the end of this week's episode of Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show. This has been episode 191. And as usual, it was you, Mumble Room, that made it all possible. If you want to see more of this fine program, head on over to jupiterbroadcasting.com. There you can find our archives, other shows' archives. Plus, go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash schedule. There you will meet a wonderful robot who will tell you what time this show is live in your time zone. Then you can be a part of our fabulous Mumble Room or just hang out in our IRC room. They help out a ton, too. Thank you for being here. We'll see you next week. Alrighty, that was the show. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Joe, especially. I thought that was a lot of fun. I certainly enjoyed uh, chatting with you, and thank you for uh, helping host today. Yeah, no problem, man. It was good to be on, and I didn't even plug Late Night Linux once. Oh, man, I meant to do that. I have it sitting here on my notes. Oh, you should have done uh, that. Oh, well. Post-show. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. I've really been enjoying Late Night Linux. Um you guys get up to some fun some fun conversations. Yeah, we had a bit of a controversial one um, that we released this week. We uh, inter interviewed Yoss from Nextcloud. Oh, about the, um, right. The scanning thing. And interviewed is one way of looking at it. Um, locking him in the kitchen and beating him up with some bats verbally is another way to look at it. <laughs> I mean, as long as you provided food in the kitchen as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah, Ike and I were very harsh on him. Probably a bit too harsh, to be honest. I feel a bit bad about all the um, the like them scanning for old versions and that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly that stuff. Yeah, right. What did you? Uh, what was your main uh, criticism? I mean, maybe I shouldn't spoil it. Well, the main main criticism is that um, it's free software. If I want to run an outdated version on my server, it's none of your business, right, even yeah. if you made it. You know, but then the other argument is, uh, you know, the greater good, the the commons. You know, it's the the spam that gets sent from these things, and the, the fact that the internet at large suffers as a result. So there are there's definitely two sides to the argument, but I'm uh, I'm pretty firmly on one side. Yeah, and I'm firmly on the other side. Huh. <laughs> That's what nice. makes this all so fun. Yeah, well, I have the so, issue where I've I've had projects where people would send me reports about. Uh, oh, there's this bug that is in your software. Yeah, we fixed it three years ago. Stop using a three-year-old software. Like that happens all the time, and it's in some cases it's 
not necessarily the fault of the user. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's the fault of the distribution that's providing those packages. But that's also an issue that Next Cloud uh, has a problem with as well. So, like, if you go to most distros, the version of Next Cloud is super old, mm. and or an own cloud, for example, was like they were. They even had like a a press release saying, "Please don't use the default packages from whatever distro you're using for that particular reason." Because if if you keep sending, like, essentially, it's spam. If there's a there's a problem you have, and there's a bug report already. And then that bug report is fixed. And then two years pass by and you continue to use something and continue to complain about a bug report that is already fixed. It's at that point, it's, it's absolutely user stubbornness. Surely there's a solution though. Pseudo snap install, um, next cloud. Yep. Snap solve that. Yep. Or, uh, some people would probably use Docker. They also solve the perpetual update problem because when I installed Nextcloud, I had 10 point something. And when 11 came out, it just upgraded automatically in the background. Nice. So it's, yeah, yeah, see, that's a big win right there. Yeah. I mean, are there just, are they, yeah, I think, I mean, maybe it does highlight some of the pain points of, you know, the distribution model that we have relied on and kind of makes it uh, point right at snaps as something that we, you know, we do need so that we can have these independent channels, but still keep all the other benefits we get. I but to be fair, a PHP. People. To be fair, a PHP application like that um, can update itself if you've configured it correctly. Sure, like yeah, that's true. WordPress, you know, my WordPress installations update themselves all the time. You know, so that that's what the solution is to me, really. 